Kill a Mockingbird by Harpoy. This book was written in 1960, a time of deep prejudice against black people in America and as hard as it is to believe. than today. A lawyer's advice to his children as he defends the real mockingbird of our police classic novel. A black man charged with the rape of a white girl through the eyes of Scout Jim and Finch. Happily explores with exuberant humour the irrationality of adult attitudes to race and class in the deep south of the 1930s the conscience of a town steeped in prejudice, violence and hypocrisy is pricked by the stamina of a young man struggling for justice but the weight of history will only tolerate so much so his advice to his children was, shoot all the blue jays you want, if you can hear them, but remember, it's a sin to kill a mockingbird. Now, some of you may have already read this book, as over 30 million copies have been sold. 60 years since it was published but some of you may not have read it yet either way I hope you enjoy reading this together for Mr. Lee and Alice in consideration of children once. One. When he was nearly thirteen, my brother Jim got his arm badly broken at the elbow. When it healed, and Jim's fears of never being able to play football were assuaged, he was seldom self conscious about his injury. His left arm was somewhat shorter than his right. When he stood or walked, the back of his hand was at right angles to his body, his thumb parallel to his thigh. He couldn't have cared less so long as he could pass and punt. When enough years had gone by to enable us to look back on them, we sometimes discussed the events leading to his accident. I maintained that the well started it all, but Jem, who was four years my senior, said it started long before that. He said it began in the summer Dill came to us, when Dill first gave us the idea making Boo Radley come out. I said if he wanted to take a broad view of the real thing, it really began with Andrew Jackson. If General Jackson hadn't run, the creek sucked the creek. Simon Finch would have never paddled up the Alabama. And where would we be if he hadn't? We were far too old to settle an argument and this fight, so we consulted Atticus. Our father said we were both right. Being southerners, it was a source of shame to some members of the family that 
that we have no recorded ancestors on either side of the Battle of Hastings. All we had was Simon Finch, a fur trapping apocryphal from Cornwall, whose piety was exceeded only by his stinginess. In England, Simon was irritated by the persecution of those who called themselves nephews at the hands of their more liberal brethren, and as Simon called himself a Methodist, he worked his way across the Atlantic to Philadelphia, thence to Jamaica, thence to Mobile, and up the St. Stephen's, mindful of John Wesley's strictures on the use of words in buying and selling, Simon made a pile practicing medicine, but in this pursuit he was unhappy lest he be tempted into doing what he knew was not for the glory of God, as the putting of gold and costly apparel. So Simon, having forgotten his teacher's dictum on the possession of heathen chattels, bought three slaves and with their aid established a homestead on the banks of the Alabama River, some forty miles above St. Stephen's. He returned to St. Stephen's only once, to find the wife, and, and with her established a line that ran high to daughters. Simon lived to an impressive age, and died rich. It was customary for the men in the family to remain on Simon's homestead, Finch's Landing, and make their living with cotton. The place was self-sufficient, modest in comparison with the empires around it. The Landing, nevertheless, produced everything required to sustain life, except ice, wheat flour, and articles of clothing, supplied by riverboats from Mobile. Simon would have regarded with impotent fury the disturbance between the North and the South, as he yet left his descendants stripped of everything but their land. Yet the tradition of living on the land remained unbroken until well into the 20th century, when my father, Atticus Finch, went to Montgomery to read law and his younger brother went to Boston to study medicine. Their sister Alexandra was the Finch who remained at the landing. She married a taciturn man who spent most of his time lying in the hammock by the river, wondering if his trunk lines were full. My father was admitted to the bar. He returned to Maycomb and began to practice Maycomb some twenty miles east of Finch's Landing, was the country seat of Maycomb County. Atticus's office in the courthouse contained little more than a hat rack, a spittoon, a checkerboard, and an unsullied cord of Alabama. His first two clients were the last hanged, two persons hanged, in the Maycomb County Jail. Atticus has urged them to accept the state's generosity in allowing them to plead guilty to second degree murder and escape there with their lives. But they were here first in Macon County, a name synonymous with jackass. The men of Hayfords had dispatched Macon's leading blacksmith in a misunderstanding arising from the alleged wrongful detention of a mayor were imprudent enough to do it in the presence of three witnesses and insisted that the son of a bitch had it coming to him was a good enough defence for anybody. They persisted in pleading not guilty to first degree murder so there was nothing much Atticus could do for his clients except be present at their departure an occasion that was probably the beginning of my pro father's profound distaste for the practice of criminal law. During his first five, first five years in Maycomb, Atticus practiced economy more than anything. 
for several years thereafter. He invested his earnings in his brother's education. John Hale Finch was ten years younger than my father and chose to study medicine at a time when cotton was not worth growing. But after getting Uncle Jack started, Atticus derived a reasonable income from the law. He liked Maycomb. He was Maycomb County born and bred. He knew his people, they knew him. And because of Simon Finch's industry, Atticus was related by blood or marriage to nearly every family in the town. Maycomb was an old town. But it was a tired old town when I first knew it. In rainy weather the streets turned to red slop. Grass grew on the sidewalks. The courthouse sacked in the square. Somehow it was hotter then. A black dog suffered on a summer's day. Bony mules hitched to the hoover carts. Flicked flies in the sweltering shade of the live oaks on the square. Men's stiff collars wilted by nine in the morning. Ladies bathed before noon, after their three o'clock naps. And by nightfall, were like soft tea cakes with frostings of sweat and sweet talcum. People moved slowly then. They ambled across the square, Shuffled in and out of stores around it. Took their time about everything. A day was 24 hours. Long but seemed longer. There was no hurry. For there was nowhere to go. Nothing to buy. And no money to buy it with. Nothing to see outside the boundaries of Maycomb County. But it was a time of vague optimism. For some of the people, Maycomb County had recently been told it had nothing to fear but fear itself. We lived on the main residential street in the town, Atticus Gemini, plus Calpurnia, our cook. Gem and I found our father satisfactory. He played with us, read to us, and treated us with courteous detachment. Calpurnia was something else again. She was all angles and bones. She was nearsighted. She squinted. Her hand was wide as a bed slat and twice as hard. She was always ordering me out of the kitchen, asking why I couldn't behave as well as Jem when she knew he was older, and calling me home when I wasn't ready to come. Our battles were epic and one-sided. Calpurnia always won. Mainly because Atticus always took her side. She had been with us ever since Jem was born. And I had felt her tyrannical presence as long as I could remember. Our mother died when I was two. So I never felt her absence. She was a Graham from Montgomery. Atticus met her when he was first elected to the state legislature. He was middle-aged then. She was 15 years his junior. Jem was the product of their first year of marriage. Four years later I was born. Two years later our mother died of a sudden heart attack. They said it ran in her family. I did not miss her, but I think Jem did. He remembered her clearly, and sometimes in the middle of a game would sigh at length, then go off and play by himself behind the car house. When he was like that, I knew better than to bother him. When I was six and Jem was nearly ten, our summertime boundaries, within calling distance of Calpurnia, were Mrs. Henry Lafayette Du Bois's house, two doors to the north of us, and the Radley Bray place, three doors to the south. We were never tempted to break them. The Radley place was inhabited by an unknown entity, the mere description of whom was enough to make us behave for days and end. Mrs. Dubois was plain hell. That 
was the son of Dom Dilkin to us. Early one morning, we were beginning our day's play in the back yard. Gem and I heard something next door in Mrs. Rachel Haverford's collar patch. We went to the wire fence to see if there was a puppy. Mrs. Rachel's rat terrier was expecting. Instead, we found someone sitting looking at us. Sitting down. He wasn't much higher than the collars. We stared at him until he spoke. Hey! Hey yourself! Said Jem pleasantly. I'm Charles Baker Harris, he said. I can read. So what? I said. I just thought you would like to know I can read. You got anything that needs reading? I can do it. Asked Jem. Four and a half. Going seven. Shoot, no wonder then. Said Jem, jerking his thumb at me. Scouts yonder been reading ever since she was born. And she ain't even started school yet. You a rap puny for going on seven. I'm little, but I'm old, he said. Jem brushed his hair back to get a better look. Why don't you come over, Charles Baker Harris, he said. Whoa, what a name. It's not funnier than yours. M. Rachel says, your name's Jeremy Atticus Finch. Jem scowled. I'm big enough to fit mine, he said. Your name's longer than you are. Bet it's a foot longer. Folks call me Dill, said Dill, struggling under the fence. Do better if you go over it instead of under it, I said. Where did you come from? Dill was from Meridian, Mississippi, was spending the summer with his aunt, Miss Rachel, and will be spending every summer in May going from now on. His family was from Macon County. His mother worked for a photographer in Meridian, had entered his picture in a beautiful child contest and won five dollars. She gave the money to Dill, who went to the picture show with twenty times on it. Don't have any picture shows here except Jesus ones in the courthouse sometimes, said Jim. Ever see anything good? Dill had seen Dracula, a revelation that moved Jem to eyeing with a beginning of respect. Tell it to us, he said. Dill was a curiosity. He wore blue linen shorts that buttoned to his shirt. His hair was snow white and stuck to his head like duck fluff. He was a year my senior, but I towered over him. As he told us, old tale, his blue eyes would lighten and darken, his laugh was sudden and happy. He habitually pulled a cowlick in the centre of his forehead. When Dill reduced Dracula to dust, and Jem said, the show sounded better than the book, I asked Dill where his father was. You ain't said anything about him. I haven't got one. Is he dead? No. Then if he's not dead, you haven't got one, have you? You've got one, have you? Dill blushed, and Jem told me to hush, a sure sign that Dill had been studied and found acceptable. Thereafter, the summer passed in routine contentment. Routine contentment was improving our tree house that rested between giant twin china berry trees in the backyard for sing. Running through our list of dramas based on the works of Oliver Optic, oh. Victor Appleton, and Edgar Rice Burroughs. In this matter, we were lucky to have Dill. He played the character parts formerly thrust upon me the ape in Tarzan, Mr. Crabtree in The River Boys, Mr. Damon in Tom Swift. Thus, we came to know Dill as the Pocket Merlin. 
whose head teemed with eccentric plans, strange longings and quaint fancies. But by the end of August our repertoire was vapid from countless reproductions and it was then that Dill gave us the idea of making Boo Radley come out. The Radley place fascinated Dill. In spite of our warnings and explanations, he drew him as the moon draws water, but drew him no nearer than the light pole on the corner, a safe distance from the Radley gate. There he would stand, his arm around the fat pole, staring and wondering. The Radley place jutted into a sharp curve beyond the house, walking south, mum faced its porch. The sidewalk turned and ran beside the law. The house was low, was once white, with a deep front porch and green shutters, but had long ago darkened to the colour of the slate grey yard around it. Rain rotten shingles drooped over trees kept the sun away. The remains of a picket drunkenly guarded the front yard, a swept yard that was never swept, where Johnson grass and rabbit tobacco grew in abundance. Inside the house was a malevolent phantom. People said he existed, but Gemini had never seen. People said he went out at night when the moon was high and peeped in windows when people's azaleas froze in a cold snap, it was because he had breathed on them. Any stealthy crimes committed in Mako were his work. Once the town was terrorised by a series of morbid nocturnal events, people's chickens and household pets were found mutilated, although the culprit was Crazy Addy, who eventually drowned himself in Back as Eddie, people still looked at the Radley place, <coughs> unwilling to discard their initial suspicions. A black person would not pass the Radley place at night. He would cut across to the sidewalk opposite and whistle as he walked. The Maycomb school grounds adjoined the back of the Radley lot. From the Radley chicken yard, tall pecan trees shook their fruit into the schoolyard, but the nuts lay untouched by the children. Radley beacons would kill you. A baseball hit into the Radley yard was a lost ball, and no questions asked. Misery of that house began many years before Gem and I were born. The Radleys, welcome anywhere in the town, kept to themselves a predilection unforgivable in Maycomb. They did not go to church, Maycomb's principal recreation, but worshipped at home. Mrs. Radley seldom ever crossed the street for a mid morning coffee break with her neighbours, and certainly never joined a missionary circle. Mr. Radley walked to town at 11.30 every morning and came back promptly at 12, sometimes carrying a brown paper bag that the neighbourhood assumed contained family groceries. I never knew how old Mr. Radley made his living. Jem said he bought cotton, a polite term for doing nothing, but Mr. Radley and his wife had lived there with their two sons as long as anybody could remember. The shutters and the doors of the Radley house were closed on Sundays. Another thing alien to Maycomb's ways. Closed doors meant illness and cold weather only. Of all, day Sunday was the day for formal afternoon visiting. Ladies wore corsets, men wore coats, children wore shoes. But to climb the Radley front steps and go, hey! of a Sunday afternoon was something their neighbours never did. The Radley house had no screen doors. I once asked Atticus if it ever had any. 
Atticus said yes, before I was born. According to neighborhood legend, when the younger Radley boy was in his teens, he became acquainted with some of the Cunninghams from Old Sarum, an enormous and confusing tribe domiciled in the northern part of the country, and they formed the nearest thing to a gang ever seen in Mako. They did little, but enough to be discussed by the town and publicly warned from free pulpits. They hung around the barber shop, they rode the bus to Abbotsville on Sundays and went to the picture show. They attended dances at the country's riverside gambling hall, the Jew Drop Inn, and fishing camp. They experimented with stump or whiskey. Nobody in Maycomb had the nerve to tell Mr. Radley that his boy was in with the wrong crowd. So, that's as far as we're going to read for today. Wishing you help, happiness and relaxation.